All right, we're live. We're back with another edition of the Manifestor Mindset. I'm sorry for everybody who turned in early on. I had a complete technological breakdown, multiple fails, uh, but I'm back and better than ever, actually, with stronger Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, so excited. I've been looking forward to doing this session for a very long time. I have an incredibly special guest. We all have the LeBron James of uh, our respective industries that we look up to as just one of the great ones. And this is my LeBron James of business right here. And I'll explain why as we talk about it. But Mark Laurie, he's the president of Walmart Ecom. I probably got that wrong, but it's an exalted title, which means he runs Ecom. Uh, he's a, a multiple founder who's had multiple successive, successful and probable exits. He thinks bigger than anybody I know. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, I'm so excited to have him with us. Make sure you ask your questions. You know, cue them up. I'll try not to monopolize this conversation and and get and leave plenty of time to uh, get to them. But uh, Mark, thank you. Hey Matt, great to see you. I love <laughs> looking forward to this. I feel like you're standing and like we're either ready to go fight somebody or like we're just going to attack the world. But, yeah, like, I, I'm that? done with sitting for zooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all standing. I like it though. There's an energy about it. Like this is this, and you know this is how I sort of perceive your personality, right? Like you're just ready to, <laughs> ready to pounce. But, uh, but let's get to this. For those who don't know Mark Laurie, uh, I, I, I'd love to just a little bit of the origin story. One of the most fascinating things is that, again, you have multiple successful ex exits, but probably the makes most sense to begin with diapers.com, right? Is that where we, is that the most logical place? We can start. That was the first big exit. Yeah. So, right uh, so I teach, I co-teach a course at HBS with uh, Lunch Lessinger, right? And and one of the things that I we uh, we always debate is you know is DTC over? You know, are there no more kind of sleepy tams? These total addressable markets that they've already been disrupted, so there's nothing to be done. So my, I guess my question to you is, you know, we'll break it up. You know, are there any more diapers to be disrupted? You know, categories that can go on, and then just tell us a little bit about your epiphany about how you decide to go into it. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you a little background. So. You know, I had a couple uh, startups and exits, but on the smaller side prior to diapers.com. And, you know, they were more things that just fell in my lap, you know, passion projects and things as, as most, you know, happens to most entrepreneurs. And then with diapers.com, I thought, let me just take a step back and just uh, kind of review the entire market and see what everything that's going on and see where the big idea is. And I just sat down in front of Google search and was searching all kinds of random keywords to find out how many times these words were searched, everything from healthcare, education, energy, retail, just searching keywords. And uh, I had a newborn baby at the time, just happened to search like the word diapers. And I saw that it was searched hundreds of thousands of times a year, I'm sorry, a month uh, on, on Google. And uh, you know, I went looking online and nobody was really selling diapers. Even Amazon at the time had some three-piece sellers at like ridiculous prices. Nobody was selling diapers at you know, sort of like big box retail prices. And I thought, huh, they're big, they're bulky. People hate going to the store to buy them. Um, so I had this sort of thesis, that hypothesis that, that uh, you know, if, if we could get moms and dads of, of new parents to buy delivered fast overnight, we could sell them everything else for baby and then eventually everything else. That was sort of the, the original thing. And we started talking to some people in the industry because, you know, we knew nothing about retail, uh, certainly nothing about diapers. And everyone said, there's a reason why no one's selling diapers at those prices, because they're lost leaders. You'll lose money. They're bulky. The shipping's expensive. It's just you're going to get hammered. You know, like, why would, why would you want to do that? I said, yeah, but nobody's, an you know, answering the question, what if we lose money in diapers and make money in everything else? And it's like, yeah, good luck. It was kind of, the, you know, the thing. And uh, Procter and & Gamble and Kimberly Clark, the makers of Pampers and Huggies, which are the two main diaper brands, they said, yeah, there's no way we're selling you diapers direct. We think this is a ridiculous business model. And we don't think people are going to even buy diapers online. Um, just a little funny anecdote. You know, fast forward 10 years later, I ran into some executives uh, that were presenting at, at, at my new company. And they were giving a presentation saying how they thought that you know, why would anybody go in the store to buy diapers anymore? They're commoditized and the market's already like greater than 50% online and they think it's going to 100. I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Your predecessors didn't agree with you. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a question there. I, I didn't realize that part of the story that, that you thought 
it would be in the end a, a loss leader, a customer acquisition tool to sell adjacent product. Is that how yeah. it came out, or were you able to make margin ultimately on the diaper itself? No, no, never made money. Well, on it was a shit business. In fact, you know when we. Yeah, the diapers was the shit. <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> right, so. You know, the, the, the funny thing is, you know, we, we sort of self-funded in the beginning. And so we would sell diapers online at these great prices with overnight free delivery. So it was an amazing experience. But then we'd have to go to the wholesale clubs, BJ's, Sam's Club, Costco, and buy the diapers there at a higher price than we sold them for and ship them out. Hmm. Um, and, you know, people were scratching their heads saying, wait a second, how does this work? So you sell the diaper box at $35. And then you go to BJ's and buy it for 40 and ship it out. Uh, yeah, that, that's basically what we do. <laughs> so what, what were the adjacent verticals that, that had good margins that, that make sense to go with your? With yeah, your so just on the diaper, uh, sort of the baby vertical, you had all the, the baby gear, strollers and, and car seats and, and cribs. You had uh, uh, baby apparel, which was very high margin, all the accessories, you know, pacifiers and bottles and all that kind of stuff. So the, the baby business, uh, you know, was, was marginally profitable. When you started to leverage those relationships, you know, we launched new websites. We launched wag.com for pets. We launched soap.com, which was like an online uh, drugstore. We launched Yo-Yo, which is an online toy site. We launched all these verticals, all connected by a common card, to leverage the audience that we had built, these right. moms and dads of new more babies. That's, that's about that's – about you already invested in your in your customer acquisition cost, right? So now you have that customer, how to sell them more things. So you move to not just within the same segment, but new segments, right? Which is kind of brilliant. So is that where, that's a little bit part of your crazy brain, right? I mean, that wasn't in the plan, was it? The, the deck that you pitched your friends and families to write that first $500,000 check, was was that in there too, that you were going to go to the dog food and, and, and other things? Yeah, that, that was it. it, it we, had, we had the big vision that we, that we presented, sure. But it was really hard to raise money, as you could imagine. Um, you know, losing money on every box of diapers, but we uh, had that's, that's actually had to, a bad indicator that it was hard to raise money in some respect. It's <laughs> it hard to raise money, and like I tell people too, you know, um, most sort of really big ideas um, don't have a lot of buy-in because if if they did, somebody would have already done it. You know, so you're dealing with a low probability of success, but big potential outcome, and and those are the kind of ideas I look for as an entrepreneur. Is I don't care about what the probability of success is, I want to know what the expected value is. Take the probability times the outcome. And if it's a really high expected value, then it's worth going for it. And uh, that's how VCs make money. They invest in a portfolio of these things. A few hit huge and the rest don't make it. Um, you know, I think I all the time, I always say that uh, complexity is our mode, right? That's good. Yeah. I'm, glad. I'm glad it's really damn hard. I'm glad it sucks. I'm glad it's making you miserable and me too, because who the hell wants to undertake it? And not only that, the other guy doesn't know how bad it is. Right? Exactly. Have the fortitude to go the distance. People undervalue the mere act of survival. How important it is just to survive another day and how tied that up is it to success? Fundamentally, there are times when I'm like, this is going to topple over. <laughs> and then you, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you go another day and then one day you're like, wow, okay, I pulled yeah. it off. Right. But so on the, along the journey, though, were there inflection points uh, for all the people out there who are struggling with? Uh, one, should I launch in the first place? But you overcome that, obviously. But there were parts where you're like, I don't know if this actually does make sense. You know, can I sustain it? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely the sustain thing because we knew we needed to raise, you know, additional rounds of capital to continue to fund the losses until we got to to this bigger vision. We believed in the bigger vision. We had learned along the way that there was money to be made in these other categories and that people buying diapers were open to buying other things. And so once we proved that to ourselves, we knew it was just a matter of time and money. But convincing investors is a whole nother story. And so with each round of financing, it was hard as anything. I mean, it was, you know, running out of cash, need to do a round and many more no's than yeses on, on fundraising. And mm -hmm. a few brave investors, you know, you know, have, have stuck with me and, you know, in, in my future uh, startups, um, it did quite well. But uh, most most said no. And I think entrepreneurs need be prepared, no matter how good your business model is, your projections, your team, most investors are going to say no. And you just have to accept that and not give up when the first five, the first 10, you know, pitches you have, you hear the word no. It doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't deter me. That's that, you know, you, you might need to, to tweak the story and the pitch and, and that sort of thing. And that's always uh, good. I see some entrepreneurs they get five no's and they wind up pivoting their business model. I'm like, wait, you told me this amazing idea 
And then you talk to five people. They said they didn't want to invest. And now you're changing the whole thing. Like, by, the way, I hate that. by the way, I hate that on Shark Tank. It's one of the number one. Uh, I immediately get out of a deal when I watch somebody go ahead and capitulate to Mark Cuban within 10 seconds. So wait a second. You did all this work, 40,000 40, people. You beat them out to get on this jet. And within a few minutes, you're letting a guy who's acting like he has a PhD in this field tell you, you know, and you've studied it for, and within 10 minutes on the set. But let me yeah. ask, as I'm watching you exude confidence and energy, which I love. But what about the people out there who are watching right now who, aren't, who are not born with this? Did you cultivate this? at all or can it be cultivated i mean i think listen i started at the bottom you know first venture was a, a couple angel investors the next venture was 60 angel investors but no institutional money could not raise institutional money and then the third venture very very hard eventually raised institutional money and then the fourth one i would say you know easier at least in the initial round to raise venture but then hard as heck to, <laughs> to do the subsequent round but like, you know, it's easy when we say like never take no for an answer or never surrender or whatnot. But but do you do you have any do you have any tangible advice for somebody to cultivate that inside themselves? You know, and I don't know if that's self-affirmation or meditation, but for those who weren't born there genetically, is there is there a hack? Yeah, there's a couple of things you can do first. And I think this is really important is to prove to the investor that you're all in. I know as an investor on the other side, that's what I look for. Like, do you have an escape hatch? I know you, you talk about this a lot, Matt, you know, this idea of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, is there is there a plan B, right? There's no no plan B. When people basically quit a good paying job and they put their savings into it and they're all in and they have to make it work, that's that's a really good point. Like, if you can't cultivate the belief, cultivate the necessity, right? Put yeah. yourself in the pro. I I always believe problems beget solutions, not the other way around. And people erect barriers to their own action by trying to figure out the solution first. How about just create the problem? Because you know we're primal beings, right? We're going to fight for our lives. The amygdala is going to flash, danger, danger. You're going to go after it. That's me. I think my my confidence is actually entirely manufactured. But I know how to do one thing, which is put myself in problematic situations, and I will find my way out of it. Right? No one, yep. no one can fight like I can fight. You know. I, I I really believe that. I I believe that if you take somebody that working in a corporation, any corporation, they're doing well, they're still driving in third gear when in a six gear uh, box. You know, like. People have no idea. They think, oh, I'm working hard. I'm doing this. True. They have no idea that there's three more gears. Believe me, when you have like a life or death kind of situation where like if this fails, you might not be able to feed your family kind of thing. You'll find that sixth gear and you'll wind up doing things that you never thought possible. And I think I put myself in a position, you know, early in the early startups and I continued it through in each case. Even when I had money, I still put it myself in a life or death kind of situation. Even when I last startup jet, when I already had a $550 million exit to Amazon, I had plenty of money. Um, but in jet, I put every friend and family member I knew into the deal. Which so you fight for it, right? Because you knew you didn't want to lose their money, right? It was I, couldn't lose, I couldn't lose my mom, dad. They don't have a lot of money. I, I couldn't yeah. lose their money. Friends, aunts, uncles, friends, a lot of pride on the line. And I felt it. It was, it, there was no like plan B there. It has to work. About that for a second. Let's take, let's catch everybody up for a second. What made you uh, decide to sell the business for an ex an incredible amount of money? Not exorbitant, because I'm sure it was fair value, but incredible amount of money. What made you decide not to keep running the play, but to exit? Uh, the sale to Amazon that was. Yeah, from diapers to to Amazon. Yeah, um, that's a good that's a good question. I thought we still had a lot of runway and a lot of upside. It wasn't as easy to raise big dollar rounds back in 2010. 11 as it is today. So we needed to raise a hundred million. Um, and Amazon at that point was really chugging along. And, and I think investor community was a little bit uh, scared of Amazon at the time. And it wasn't going to be easy to raise the hundred million. Hmm. We probably could have done it again if we had to um, and kind of get it to the next level, but it wasn't a slam dunk. The board was a little jittery and we got this offer and, you know, we'd only invested 50 million in the company. So, you know, the early investors had a 20 X, the late investors had a, you know, close to 10 X. It, it was, it was a really good, good exit for everyone. And, you know, I hadn't up until that point had a big exit and it was just good, nice to, to have, you know, put that up on the belt and, and kind of like, um, so, I'm so just let's talk about that sort of emotional experience, right? So you have this massive exit, life changing. You're now generation, generational wealth, right? Very hard to blow that money. Uh, but um, how did it change you 
in good ways. Like, for example, for me, having a taste of money actually eliminated some of the pointless anxiety that I carry about, you know, I'm not going to take care of my family. I'm going to go back to that dirty apartment in Queens, sleeping on a mattress. You know, it's still in you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that actually, that doesn't fuel me. That just actually interrupts me. So I'm curious for you, you know, what did it, did it mitigate any of your downsides? Did it unleash any more Mark Laurie uh, after that first I think I think it allowed me to, you know, even though in Diverse.com I was all in sort of financially and mentally and it had to work. I was more cautious, you know, so, so I just was more cautious with, you know, not wanting to hire really strong senior leaders in the company that would uh, hand the keys to them. You know what I mean? It, it was like a little bit different with Jet, where I had the money and I was going to go for, you know, the, the, the much bigger outcome and be able to move faster and give the keys to people, empower them, like, which is probably more of my management style than sort of getting in the weeds on stuff. But in diapers.com, um, yeah, we were in the weeds, you know, um, Vinny and I were, were sort of um, doing everything and it was hard to let go because it, it, there was this incredible fear that like, you know, nobody's going to, going to put in the kind of effort we're putting in and we just couldn't risk it, you know, but, but that's, I would have recommended if you really want to, build a, a really large business. At some point you have to take your hands off the wheel, hire a great team and think more visionary and, and think, you know, VCP, vision capital people. That's what I tell people. And that's what I, that's what I do today, but it's easier said than done when you sort of like know that your life's on the line. Right. You, know? you make the wrong choice. That's great. Yeah. I want to delegate until the train, you know, the car starts going off the, the side of the road, but question. So take us back time. So you leave that, you have this big man, you have this massive epiphany. This is a philosophical point, but sometimes I see people stray outside their competency, right? And then you do this like really big dream. Everybody gets excited. It's kind of like what's going on with Quibi, to be perfectly honest, or like Magic Leap. And you're like, ah, it doesn't resonate with me. I don't see it. I didn't see those two, right? But then you have this. I, I we didn't know each other. I remember reading about you back in then. I'm like, and it was very secretive, raising a trillion dollars, you know. And I'm like, I, I don't know what what does this person see? Like, and yet you ended up being the winner. So I'm just curious. I want to understand the the re the revelation, so I can recognize it next time of the the bigness of the dream that you saw that made you create Jet. Oh, on the Jet side, yeah. I mean, um, you know, ha having sold uh, to Amazon and worked inside Amazon for a couple of years, and and really knew every element of, of e-commerce, having done everything you know by hand from scratch, um, I felt like you know having made the investors a lot of money, I had access to a tremendous amount of capital. I had access to uh, incredible, talented uh, people in the space. I felt very knowledgeable in the space. And so that's the C and the P of the VCP, capital and people had that. And then the vision was the only thing lacking. And after spending some time, um, you know, um, inside Amazon, I sort of just got this idea, this, this vision for um, how to create a, a e-com company that would, um, you know, just put a little twist on, on e-com to, to sort of take costs out of the system and share them with customers so they can have lower prices. That was sort of the, the, the vision. And then, and then it was just, Hey, it's, this is not a winner take all market. It's a massive market. It's growing like crazy. There's going to be a number two player next to Amazon. And really at that point, there really wasn't anyone that you could point to. Um, and so that was, that was that, you know, and, and we went at it pretty fast. We raised, I think it was like, 50, 55 million um, with just a business plan, you know, to sort of get going. Well, and a really high valuation though, right? A relatively speaking, wasn't it a, wasn't that Yeah, first? I think it was like, some, in round numbers, like 50 to 100 pre. Yeah, right. Uh, with a business plan and, and we uh, were able to hit the well, ground. More hard. than that, I remember the feeling of scoffing of like, like, please, you're going to go ahead and take on Amazon. You yeah. know, like, like I, I was, I was, and I didn't even know you, and not that I bet against it, I didn't even think it even had a shot, you know, and then we all wake up one day to read that you, and I know it didn't feel like overnight to you, but then you sell it to, to Walmart, right? How, how long was that process? Um, from the business plan to the sales, like two years. So just to break that down a bit, you know, you're back to diapers, right? You're, you're, you recognize you're, you're, you're putting all these keywords into the, right into the browser and you're looking, you're looking, 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 you're looking at the stream of data to see something, a pattern of a brand that is being purchased significantly, right? That you think is an opportunity to optimize and leverage it. So you're looking for an insight, right? But you're actually, people don't realize you were seeking out an insight based upon a simple premise, right? 
then so that that was your insight into a into a vertical. You then get a broader insight by virtue of having exposure to Amazon that there's room for a number two, right? And I think what I try to tell people all the time, like it always begins, everyone has an opportunity to observe something about society, a pattern that is actionable and that you can make money on if you have the conviction to make the jump. And like, don't discount those little revelations. Like it doesn't have to be change the world, agree. right? You saw I agree. it, you know, and you had that, what it's amazing because you keep seeing things and then you have the courage to just go after it, right? Whereas, but you're not alone in seeing things. We all see things, right? Yeah, I, I always tell people though, because I know a lot of people that want to be an entrepreneur, want to start a business, and they say, you know, I don't have a good idea. I, I don't think it's about the idea. I really don't. Um, I've seen bad ideas work well. I've seen great ideas fail. Like it's about execution and commitment and drive, tenacity. Like, you know, you just need a little bit of a twist on something that's already working, and and that's enough. And you just out execute the competition. I firmly believe that any idea can work. If you're sitting there listening to this and you have an idea and you're thinking, I'm not sure if it's good enough. It's good enough. The question is, do you want it bad enough? <laughs> I love that. It's so true. And that's kind of my point I was trying to make too, is lower the bar a bit. It usually begins with an insight, an arbitrage on a pattern, right? Like you saw a little bit of an arbitrage and then attack it, right? But if you're looking for like, I don't know, I can't find that amazing invention. I'm just not good. I haven't invented a single thing. I feel a little inadequate about it. I'd like to one day, but my great grandfather invented Higgins Inc. That would have been cool. But okay. I see a lot of patterns though. And I see a lot of arbitrage and I attack that arbitrage. Yeah. That's exactly what you do, right? Yeah. I, I think a lot of people, it's funny. They expect when they have an idea, they start telling their friends and family, and they're really worried about telling anyone because they're worried their friends are probably going to share it. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> they won't actually share your idea with as many people as possible. You know what they're going to do? They're going to tell you like that doesn't make sense. Why it doesn't work? Right. You, you're just not going to get. Wow, I I want I want to do that. That sounds amazing. I've never. That's where your value is. If they've to your point, if everyone recognized that it was a great idea, it would be it would be out there already. Like yeah. you, you need people to scoff a bit. But it's so true. And the other point is when people get protective over sharing because they're afraid it's going to be copied. There's a great line in the in the movie Social Network about you know Mark Zuckerberg, and he's in the deposition with the brothers, right? And he yeah. finally goes, listen, if you had invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. <laughs> and it's like, it's kind of the way life is. So anybody out there who's being so precious with your brilliant idea, like unless you're Apple sharing new features, like don't worry about it. Talk to people, but don't talk, but make sure you talk to the right people because you talk to haters. There, everyone's going to give you a general cynicism, but at least if you talk to optimistic pragmatists, they're going to give you the 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 kind of the the uh, the little bit of prodding about how to actually execute. They're not going to they're not going to attack the idea. They're gonna they're gonna audit your capacity to execute, your willingness to execute, your steps you're going to take, right? Which mm -hmm. is what you've done all along. What makes you then you have this tremendous success with Jet? You're it's obviously working enough for Walmart to come along. What made you decide to make that change that move? Yeah, you know, after selling the company to Amazon, this is kind of interesting. Um, Amazon said, uh, you know, why don't you continue to run diapers.com just the way you were running it? We don't want to integrate. We don't want to ru ruin the magic, the secret sauce that you have. Just keep running it the way you're running it. And I think they, the thinking was entrepreneurs must love to hear that, you know, rather than get like, you know, integrated into the into the mothership, be able to run it the way you've been running it. The only, the only problem was maybe that could work in some cases, but we're competing with the mothership. If they were selling diapers, we were selling diapers. Who wants to be owned by someone that you're competing with? It just, it just didn't feel great. We weren't part of the bigger uh, you know, uh, future mission and vision of, the, of, of Amazon itself. And we kind of just felt like you know, uh, orphans just kind of on the side here, and it wasn't that motivating. And so with Jet, you know, when I got to meet Doug McMillan, the CEO then and, and still is, um, you know, started building a great relationship, built trust between us. And I, I really liked, you know, his his vision for Walmart and what it could become. And uh, he felt like technology and e-commerce was, was going to be a, a huge part of what will make Walmart ultimately survive and be successful and thrive in the future. And I told him, I said, listen, I would love to, to do this with you because I have the same vision. Um, but, you know, in order for this to really work, you can't just buy jet and keep it on, on the side and have it run and compete against Walmart. I said, if you really want to do this, then, you know, give us the keys to e-commerce and we'll, we'll take jet, we'll merge it into Walmart e-com and we'll create a viable competitor to Amazon. And when he said, yeah, that's exactly what we want you to do. That was, you know, that was inspiring. And, and that really got us motivated because any entrepreneur 
when they start a startup has a vision for what they want to ultimately turn the, the startup into. And I think with Walmart, we were able to see and still go after that same vision, but with a higher probability of success um, and a faster timeline with a lot more capital behind us. You know, so it was like it was just it was more missionary than it was there was anything else, despite the big exit. Um, it, it was sort of, um, you know, that was that was the reason for selling. So let's um, so everybody, I see these questions piling up, which are great. By the way, I see them on the corner of my eye. Keep them coming. I'm going to get to them in five minutes. I promise Heather on my team is going to throw them up. I want to give Walmart a little bit of love because Walmart is an amazing company. I mean, with a, an incredible footprint, you know, so many different reasons why they wouldn't innovate, right? Or couldn't innovate. And yet they legitimately are a contender to Amazon. They have the, they have the retail footprint. Very easy to transform that retail into the uh, last mile delivery op uh, operations. You have, the, you have the employee base, right, uh, to handle logistics. Just uh, Walmart fascinates me. So if you could just tell us a little bit about that scale, that reach, and, and just about the company itself. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the, the future of retail is about omnichannel. It's not right. going to be just online, not just brick and mortar. It's going to be the merge of the two. And Walmart's in a, in a great position with 4,700 stores located within 10 miles and 90% of the U.S. population. So all that product, there's about 100,000 SKUs of the best-selling stuff in a super center. So you imagine those 100,000 SKUs, including, you know, fresh food um, and, and, and located really close to the customers. And so those stores double as warehouses. You're able to pick product out of there and deliver to a customer fast. But the marginal cost to pick is very low because all the overhead is already covered by the walk-in traffic. So if you were to put a warehouse right next to a Walmart super center, you have to do so many sales just to cover the overhead uh, of, of the warehouse itself. Walmart store is already covering the overhead. So that marginal pick comes out of a really nice profit and we're able to deliver it to a customer same day um, now with Walmart Plus, you can get it for free uh, with the $98 membership, get free same day delivery of fresh frozen and everything in a super center. We think that's a really uh, powerful value proposition. Yes. So everybody watching right now, they're going to make a little prediction, right? If, if you think the war of e-com is won by Amazon, you have to realize it's in the first inning. And COVID mm -hmm. has permanently changed behavior. There was, you know, I don't know what the numbers is, 12% adoption, right? Penetration of e-com prior to COVID, whatever the numbers are. The reality is that's changed forever. And to your side, Futures Omnichannel, Walmart already has the built-in footprint, but also has the corporate psychology. Right. If they didn't have the attitude that would enable them to pivot, that's different right now. You know, like if they were the blockbuster and, you know, Amazon's the Netflix, but they're the, they're more like the Netflix, too. Right. So it's yeah, going to be you know, watching this next chapter is now is when the fight will be will be uh, litigated. I'm excited about that. Let's pivot for a second. Very, I want to set this up and then we'll take questions. One of the things I love about you is uh, just because you don't know a space necessarily, you have no fear of getting into it. So long as you see something, you trust the validity of your insights, right? And so I want to talk to everybody about flying cars for a second. I was reading a good article. I think you it's now out there, Mark, that you are uh, backing Archer, right? Yep. Uh, but for everyone to see this, so you remember this podcast down the road, we're like, oh man, I heard about that from Mark Laurie. Paint a picture of what's gonna happen with this little company that you backed and, uh, and flying cars. Yeah, with, with all these new technologies, like you mentioned Magic Leap and virtual reality, there's virtual reality, augmented reality, drones, eVTOLs, computer vision, machine learning. Like you hear all this, all this tech. Um, I think it, it, it comes down in a lot of cases to timing. All these things will eventually be part of the future. The question is, when do you get in? Um, you know, eVTOLs, these electric vertical takeoff and landing, these, these sort of, sort of quote unquote flying cars, they started investing, you know, more than a decade ago into these companies. And a lot of those companies have burned through a lot of cash but a lot of learnings have taken place. And I think now with all those learnings and, and the advancements in battery technology and things, we're at an inflection point where in the next five years, you're gonna see an explosion. Um, and I do think within five years, you will see people in electric vertical takeoff and landing eVTOLs flying around. Like the, it will be, um, I expect to have one myself within five years. I actually so, believe in that idea more than I believe in self-driving cars because you, there's less uh, less logistics. The behavior already exists. There is a helicopter, right? But it's got yes. turbine engines. It's loud. The municipalities hate them. So the behavior exists, right? And so you just need to pivot and turn into an electric vehicle. That and they're safer than helicopters. They're right. less noisy. 
and cheaper. And they're right. autonomous, largely autonomous. So there's a lot of advantages there. But that's what I love about this one. So if you, if I sort of use my pattern recognition skills on your pattern recognition skills, <laughs> you seem to go all in on insights that don't take a lot of leap of faith to imagine they're going to materialize, but are still big, complicated dreams to pursue where others are sitting by the sidelines and waiting for it to manifest. You get in at the right moment. So like you and I both agreed when you, we talked about that deck, like, of course, I mean, I'm driving around my Tesla, which is the most incredible, you know, vehicle. Helicopter flight is, is wonderful, but for these problems, right, we're going to combine the two and people are going to want to bridge these distances. Uber's already trying to do it with an old outdated technology called a turbine helicopter, right? And and of, of course, it's going to happen, right? You, nothing that you do is not like, it requires multiple leaps of faith to imagine that it's going to materialize other than the courage to back the management team and do the hard work. And yes. you told me about the two founders you back, as I said, there are like 40 of these companies now, Mark. Like, how do we know that these two random guys, you said, because they're the best operators I've ever worked with in my life. End of story. Yep, that's it. I can't this really is, make that. <laughs> I go back to VCP. You know, the people are great. Question is, can they raise capital? They just did. So they just raised a, a, a lot of capital. And, uh, and they have the big vision, you know, and it's the right time. So I look at these businesses and some people think, oh, it's too risky. But, you know, when you think of the downside, there are car manufacturers, uh, you know, uh, uh, airline manufacturers, all looking at the space. There's many multi ten billion dollar plus companies in in each segment that are going to be looking for um, to get into the space in the future. So, if worst case this doesn't play out the way we think it will, um, the asset is there. They're going to have the the, the best EV tall in the market with the best team. The so that's why it comes down to hire for an engineers or even a few, you know, hundreds of thousands just for that yeah. infrastructure, right? The, the question I asked myself was, was, was this team capable of hiring the best team in the market? And were they capable of raising the money required? And I said yes to both. That was that was a go sign for me. Once I once I knew that it was the right time for this for this market. Right, let's take we'll see how it plays out. We can right, right. <laughs> watch this in five if years. You want to see the future, go check out and hold us accountable. Go check out Archer, <laughs> right? Just uh, Archer. Uh, flyarcher.com, yep. Flyarcher.com, Google's a couple interesting articles about it. Also the fact, a really good article about how these were completely new new entrants to the marketplace in a crowded field. This was the bet that Mark made. It made complete sense to me when I saw it. Let's see what you think and see. Uh, but, but if we're right, five years from now, you're going to be taking a ride to Kennedy Airport in one of them if you're in New York. So let's do some questions. I don't know if you can see this, Mark, but I could throw it out if you can't. Yeah, well, I can't really see. All right, let me, let me throw them out to you. What will be the battleground area? Did we lose you? He's like, I can't see it, so I'm out. I'm out, people. I'm gonna give him a second to come back in. That was not my my Wi-Fi. I'm still here. Anyway, isn't he great? I love sharing him. I like finding people slightly below the radar. You know, Mark is too busy. Uh, uh, it's focusing on execution to be out there doing uh, what I'm doing. So maybe that maybe I should reflect on my priorities because he is really successful. But I love talking to you. Um, he uh, just just so insightful and so interesting. How somebody could over and over and over again, be able to pick winners. And it's not, it's what I always say all the time, it's not a lotto ticket, right? It's not, there's not like this incredible eureka moment and then it just worked out. There's no luck involved. It's always the same sort of a little bit of insight on a pattern, whatever, you know, God or your natural gifts or your experience gave you to recognize that pattern. I have no idea why he was Googling back in whatever year and looking at different keywords, but Whatever insight he had, he then leveraged that insight with everything he's got. And you only need a small sliver of an insight to go ahead and press it to be successful. And then he did the same thing with, you know, Jet. So it's really interesting to have somebody on who's just this multiple track record of success. And I'll give him another another minute. Heather, why don't you put up some questions and then I'll talk. I know uh, until Mark jumps back on and he doesn't jump back on. So what? So what does the future of e-commerce look like to you? I'll, I'll give you uh, my answers. I spent a lot of time thinking about this through a, a course at at, uh, at HBS. I think it's a fascinating period of time. Obviously, COVID fueled tremendous adoption and uh, huge numbers. But just from the companies in our portfolio, I'm seeing that uh, uh, that there's a new steady state that is going to hold uh, significantly more adoption. I don't think retail is dead by any stretch. There he is. So I was just talking about the future of e-commerce, just giving my thoughts on it. But I retail is definitely not not dead. So there's going to be a convergence of omni-channel strategy better than has ever happened before. So if you're a DTC company, you're going to need to still figure out how to have 
touch points in the real world. And the reason why is people still want to interact with their beloved brands. And there's data to support what happens when they do. When they interact with an e-commerce pure play brand in a pop-up at a retail, the returns go down, the loyalty goes up, the long-term value of that customer is great. So there, there aren't going to be pure plays one way or another for this, you know, brick and mortar traditional players, not saying anything that isn't painfully aware to like best bet, best uh, bed, bath and beyond, just to point them out. You are going to have to have a robust omni-channel strategy or else you're going to succumb. So I think, I think that is the point and the tough part for a lot of these companies, especially if you've been DTC only, how do you develop the competencies to go brick and mortar to be able to compete when you haven't done it before. But Mark, more importantly, I want to hear your thoughts, the future of e-commerce. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, I think less friction is where it's going. We, we know that delivery times are getting faster and faster. It's not uncommon now to get same day delivery. You'll continue to see faster delivery times, um, more and more products delivered same day and even within two hours. But the next sort of step change will be, I think, delivery directly into your home, directly into your refrigerator. Um, and so we've already tested that in, in a few markets and customers absolutely love it. You're at work, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a camera on the, the vest of the Walmart associate, you know, puts the stuff in your fridge, leaves, and uh, mm -hmm. you can watch it, you know, on your, uh, on your phone if you want for, for security. What's really helpful to me is my wife's always trying to figure out who ate like the leftovers in the middle of the night. I'd be like, <laughs> it was the Walmart guy. I mean, <laughs> it's not like she's going to call to get the camera feed, whatever, but you know, I have a little bit of eating problem at night. But, um, but uh, that's interesting. You know, in China, when I was in China a bunch of times, not that long ago, right? I was in Shanghai, but I'm amazed how much they've been able to bridge the last mile. Like you'd be on the, on the, uh, on the train and you could scan a QR code, order your food, get home and be at your door in like 30 minutes. You know, and we tend to think that we're so advanced, you know, technologically in a lot of ways, we're actually been left behind. When, when Absolutely. You, I mean, you start right. combining that, you know, autonomous vehicles are going to bring down the cost of delivery quite a bit. So, you know, it'll be more cost effective to do faster delivery. And then, of course, drones as well. Um, we already started testing drone deliveries. That is also coming in the very near future. Can you paint, um, understand this? Can you paint a picture for the winning solution of a drone? It's not in an urban dense environment, presumably. It's a, just to help me understand how you how do you do you regulate the airspace and where are we going to be having drone delivery? Yeah, I mean, just take any suburban neighborhood. You know, take your local Walmart supercenter with a little uh, drone launching pad. Um, you order products, stick it on the drone. It flies and parachutes it down within a couple meter. Uh, target zone or whatever you, you know, ask it to, whether it be the front lawn, the backyard, the driveway, um, and it's fully autonomous. It'll go to your house, come back, pick up another product, go back out. Um, so yeah, we're, yeah, we're already testing this I'm now. Becoming, I think I'm becoming a curmudgeon or a little bit old because part of me is like, what do I need that for? <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I really need a drone dropping shit like on my house, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's the future of recovery. Let's put up another one. Let's see what we got. Mark, what Mark, what platform do you believe is the best for a company stepping into e-commerce for the first time? This is interesting because you, if you say something other than the one I would think, uh, that tells me there's another one I should be thinking about. But when I say platform, I assume they mean if you're a startup looking to build your own e-commerce business. Yeah, presumably right? that's the question. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, I haven't done a lot of that. I've, I've mentored and advised some people doing startups, and they were had a lot of success with Shopify, including my daughter. Um, so it was very easy. My, my daughter was able to, in high school, you know, start an e-commerce business herself, take payment, do the inventory, do everything herself. Um, and it was like literally 20 bucks a month, I think. Shopify is an amazing company. As much as the valuation yeah. is very high. Zoom, I question. Sorry, Zoom. Shopify, <laughs> I understand. The alchemy around what they've done is very hard to do and has done a great job. I, I, don't, I don't know who the second player is in that space, but because I only deal with Shopify. <laughs> Actually, let's wait. I got somebody from Ireland. We have to talk about this. This is more of just me being self-aggrandizing, Mark. You'll have to bear with me. Matt, this is awesome. Pre-pandemic access to your expertise would have been constrained by some physical constraint location. Now I can see you live with Mark from the comfort of my own home in Dublin, Ireland at 9.40 p.m. Awesome. By the way, I miss Ireland so much. When I get sad and I just let my mind wander, I, I go to Ireland every year with my, my boy and I miss it. But Mark, let me ask you a question off of this. You know, what do you think are going to be the permanent behavioral changes around workplace culture, startup, you know, just how do you think COVID has changed us permanently for the better? Yeah, I think, you know, in every sector, there's, uh, you know, a fast forward taking place. I mean, look at e-commerce. We clearly probably pulled growth in by maybe three to four years. 
Um, and, and that's not going to change. It's just going to continue to accelerate. There are industries like that. Food delivery is another one um, where, you know, with the restaurants closed, people moved and started ordering food in. I think that is another area where you're not going to see it necessarily go backwards. Uh, places and opportunities to, to add convenience to people's lives where there's slow to adopt. And once they do, they stick with it. Um, I'm not as much, I'm probably in the minority in saying that, you know, I think the work from home, I think there will be, uh, you know, certainly for, for quite some time, people will be working from home. But I, I could also imagine a situation, you know, five years from now where sort of people are back in the office because there's incredible value to being, you know, face to face and and hearing things and sharing things. And I'm a big believer in that. Um, so I, I think uh, people will still certainly feel more comfortable Zooming than ever before, but I'm not sure it's a trend that's going to continue and accelerate like it has in in food or or in uh, e-commerce, for example. So I, if I had to predict, you know, is are we going to be Zooming more in the future, five years from now than we are today? I'd say definitely not. Um, I think, you know, food, e-com, other industries too, um, the, the acceleration is real and will continue to compound. So just a couple I, points. I would agree with that. I think on the workplace culture, I think a few things. Uh, you said before friction. The future is a place where we try to eliminate friction for which it had no purpose, right? I think we become much more judicious about areas of our life which are full of friction. So what are they that we learned? We learned that commuting is a friction that is actually uh, it may not be worth the, the squeeze, right? To some extent, we learned that, that FaceTime just to placate each other or a boss is not actually worth the yield. We learned that travel just for a pointless meeting that could have been done virtually is a friction that both kills the environment and kills our bodies. So I I, I don't know how that manifests. So I agree with you there. This, this doesn't work exclusively, like work from home all over. Like I, I think we're also honestly allowing ourselves to heal a little bit through a tough, uncertain time. Do we have to be the most productive in a pandemic? I mean, I, I am up at like four in the morning losing my, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. Like, and that's not a brag. That is a me just trying to get through things. I think it's okay that we're not as productive right now. I mean, we give ourselves a break. But mm -hmm. coming, out of, coming out of this though, I do think a world where a hybrid is called for, where you are convening, you're cross-pollinating, you're maintaining intimacy and human connection, but you don't have gratuitous friction like getting on a train for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Could have done it from home. Like some of the life choices that I'm making, I went. I went the other day. My partner Gary Vaynerchuk and I, if we could spend four hours together, we can accomplish so much in four hours. Create millions of dollars of values, lift each other up. So I went fishing with him at seven in the morning outside the Statue of Liberty, catch some stripers. Right. I did it on a Wednesday morning. I would never have done that at like seven for because of the optics. Uh, it's a midday. It's in the middle of the week. And uh, but now that's over. I will never worry again about. Yeah optics or what. So I just think it's a, the world is a place where anything you could think of gratuitous friction that was revealed by COVID, we're going to hold on to because it makes no sense to go back. That makes yeah, sense. no, I agree with that. And I think it'll, it'll, uh, may not go back to the way it was before. I think you're right. People will travel less. They'll do more Zoom, be more comfortable working from home. I just think it's not a, a, a trend, meaning it's going to get increasingly more and more Zoom when we get back to normal. Five no. years from now is not going to be more than it is you know, a year from now. That oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. It just there's some in some 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 cases there's like a step change, which I think Zoom was, and then it'll just sort of like kind of be there. And in other cases, it's a step change and an accelerant, and it's going to continue to 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 go up into the right. right. On that, would you add the category of expectation of lack of friction in the shopping experience? I say you that you would create that as an accelerating trend, which then you know behooves us to have the last mile covered drones, whatnot, like. Those are an accelerating trend, right? Yeah, it just compounds, and it just compounds. compounds. Yeah. So uh, maybe we'll take two more questions. Heather, let me know if I'm missing anything. Actually, uh, let's do what I'm. Cu I'm curious about this. We talked about this at HBS, right? Uh, you know, you discover diapers. Are there any more of those to be, you know, uncovered? And what service-based businesses do you see taking off in e-commerce? But you can answer that broadly too. Are there in e-commerce? Yeah, do I see taking off? I, that's tougher, I think. You know, there's there's new ways of shopping that I think are interesting, like uh, conversational commerce, being able to use text and voice. I don't think you know anybody is 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 won that space yet, and I do think that will be how people shop in the future. I think this idea of just conversing with with uh, a computer that knows you as well as your mom or dad, um, and knows the products as well as the most knowledgeable person in 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 that sector. You know, I think that's the future. It'll be super personalized. That's a different, but just like 
starting a website and, and selling products, if you're going to do that, it's going to have to be a proprietary brand. Um, so I do think there's still room. People still um, like brands. And if you can create a brand and go D to C with it, I think there's still opportunity. And I think there's opportunity in just about any segment of the market um, where um, you know, people, uh, where brands matter. Yeah, and I, think, I think any segment of the market too, where you see a commoditized experience that we never thought to like question, like I always love the idea of the boarding pass. When you see all these numbers, you can't read it. Like why didn't anybody make a boarding pass that you could actually read? You know, there's always commoditizable experiences that we, that are not customer focused, that are massive markets. I look at what Capsule's doing on, on online uh, you yes. know, delivery, right? You're like, yep. this is a crappy experience. And yet this is like a trillion dollar industry. And then overnight they launch online delivery of medicine. And I'm sure we'll be eliminating the friction of the renewal. Then we'll be inserting a primary doctor into that now because telemedicine has been, we just pulled, we just blew that space apart. So yep. like, I even think telemedicine is a great thing to meditate on for a second. You, a year ago, you would have said, oh, it's gonna take a long time. Smile Direct was getting you know, criticized by orthodontists. It's like tough and it's so hard to launch a tell. Fast forward six months later. And of course, no one could predict the pandemic, but there's always a thing like that that is disrupting and creating a cleave in society and the way we behave. And now yeah. there is unfathomable, like you can't even conceive the different versions of telemedicine businesses that are gonna be created, right? Like yeah. You, so they're the That's version. another one of those trends, the, the health and wellness, the yeah. telemedicine, those trends, I think it's a step change and an accelerant. Um, those, 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 were, that was gonna happen. Um, well, let's ask this and then I'll, I'll, I'll release you into the, cause I know you're standing up this long. <laughs> what do you do if you have a big vision, uh, but struggle with writing the business plan? It's a good practical, tactical question. Um, first off, I would, you know, be, before even writing, when you say business plan, as you mean like actually writing stuff, I, I think uh, just starting with a very simple, you know, 10 slide PowerPoint, you know, starting with, you know, what exactly is it? What's your mission? Why you exist? What's the big vision? Write a paragraph on what you think this business is going to become if it goes exactly the way you see it in five or 10 years. What's the problem you're solving? What's your unique solution? Your competitive advantage, uh, and 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 some financials that uh, you know really high level that gives some sense of how much capital you're going to need. Just some like basic, and then from there you can start filling in some of the details. But you got to get the building blocks set, and it really starts with with having a really clear vision statement, both mission why you exist, and then vision. Um, and a lot of people don't spend enough time you're really thinking through the vision. And if you ask them questions about it, they won't be able to answer it because they haven't had that. It's not like clear in their head. Exactly. You have to know what you want to become before you try and become it. That's great advice. I, I feel people are almost afraid to do the culling to get to the vision. They just want to throw everything at it. I think another mistake people make, you, you're trying to solicit and get somebody to, to convert to be an evangelist of your dream. It's not about you then, it's about that. It's about not about you, it's about them. So you have to step outside yourself and say, if I were objectively looking at this and you're asking to part with my precious dollars, what would I need to see? And what I always say, the number one thing, I need you to eliminate the, the different areas where I have to hope that something works out in order for you to be right. The yep. more steps that I have to hope that, for, <laughs> that it works out for this to be right, the scarier I am about taking it that. So how do you eliminate hope? Obviously a logical sequence, showing traction, doesn't mean people have to be buying your product, but you have to show me some analogous version of traction that tells me you're tapping into the mainframe, you know, of, of society in a way that de-risks it. But I, the mm -hmm. uh, best advice I can give you, uh, Tariko, is like, just audit what you're presenting and ask yourself, do I have to hope for five things to happen in order for that to materialize? Or is it a well thought out strategy and vision? Yeah, uh, I think that's great. I think that's great advice, Matt. I think that the reasons to believe, try and, and each round, there's a primary reason to believe and it changes with each successive round. Um, mm -hmm. Needing to know what the reason to believe is in each round and try and eliminate all the other things that you're asking investors to believe and just focus on one. The other thing I was just thinking about as you were talking is I think a lot of entrepreneurs conflate the, the vision with the tactics and where they are today. And so they're sort of like in the weeds doing some stuff and, and they're uh, not able to sort of step outside and say, even though I'm doing this, even though I'm selling diapers, you know, on the internet, losing money, you know, that's not what I'm selling to investors. I'm selling to investors the vision 
And then I'm saying, okay, well, in order to get there, I'm starting here and let me show you the sequence of the moves to go from where I am today to the big vision. And you have to spend just as much time on the big vision as, as the tactical place that you are today. And a lot of times I don't see that, like there's not enough time spent on the vision, too much on the tactics of where you are and investors get caught up and think it's sort of a small idea when really it's just a stepping stone to a much bigger idea. That's a great point. And a lot of that can come from many places. It could come from insecurity about the audacity of even stating it. Like, I'm afraid yes. to really say that my vision, like you had, I'm just going <laughs> to throw a bunch of diapers and lose money because I'm going to, so that's audacious, right? So you're insecure about that. You're insecure about the ridicule. You feel like you're not, you're not there yet. So where do you get off, you know, projecting so far ahead of yourself? I always say this, when you're launching a business, you have to project your future opportunity cost. You have to already have a sense of who you're going to become three to five years down the road, because when at the moment arrives, this won't be interesting to you anymore. And you're enlisting <laughs> in a three to five year, you know, uh, military assignment, and then you're going to lose your your. But that's hard for people to do to really audit like who am I meant to be? That's why yeah. you got you, you have to. It all goes back to what I always say: you have one job you can't outsource. You have to love yourself because then you'll make those wrong decisions. You'll lobby for people's approval, but you always got to forecast your future opportunity cost. Oh. Absolutely. That's a great point. I could talk to you all day. So I have. Yeah, a I know. Me too, Matt. I got I have a question. I, jump. I have a question. Okay. All right. Oh, I, want you to, I want you to write a book because I want to hear everything. Oh. You, <laughs> you have so much great wisdom to share. You've got a big heart and uh, you've had so much extraordinary scalable success. So unusual to have somebody have multiple bigger and bigger outcomes. So I hope one day you write one. That's my little bit of a, a, a encouragement for you. I, <laughs> everybody on here would read it and I would read it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great right. seeing you. All right. Take care. Uh, take Thanks. care. All right, bye-bye.